Seven, it's rbwwave.com. Yeah, and we're live. Thanks. And we're live. Okay, great. Okay. So, Lior, it is an absolute pleasure to welcome you and all of our guests uh, to Rome. And we're absolutely thrilled to have you, I mean, one of the most acclaimed guides in, in all of the region. Uh, you should know you are beloved by people who have been on tours with you. And um, it's absolutely an honor for us and the RVW, fam the RVW family uh, to be with you on this exciting tour of uh, one of the most amazing cities uh, in the world. And you know that that's why you choose to live there. So we'll, you'll, we'll be covering its art, its architecture, its majesty, its history, the story, and seeing all the sights and hearing perhaps some of the insights um, that this magical city has to reveal. Um, you will tell us, I'm sure, why it is referred to as the Eternal City. Uh, you will tell us, I am sure, uh, how come Rome is not the first capital or the only capital, but it's actually the third capital of Italy. And I want to read before I introduce you what the Lonely Planet says about why one should visit Rome. And here it is. A heady mix of haunting ruins, awe-inspiring art, and vibrant street life. Italy's capital is one of the world's most romantic, and charismatic cities. And those of us who are clients of RVW, of course, there are only two kinds, those who are clients and those who are not clients yet. But for those who are already clients, you are invited to partake of the beautiful Bartonura wine that has been sent to you in your box of goodies, together with the snacks, munchies, and the map of Rome and other stuff. Everyone who is a client and responded timely got a terrific box of stuff. And I hope that you would indulge in all that stuff as we go on this incredible journey with Lior. Lior, it's a pleasure to have you lead our tour, and it's over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for this great pleasure and opportunity of uh, meeting you again and meeting all of these wonderful people. And thank you very much for joining. Uh, I know that it's supposed to be something like 5 o'clock at your time. Here in Italy, we're already deep into the night. It's 2 o'clock at night, but it's always a great, great and beautiful pleasure to talk about this wonderful city all of the year, every single moment of the day. So thank you again for this opportunity. Let me share the screen with you so we can start and see the beauty together. There we are. Second. There we are. 
So again, hello everybody and welcome. I'm very, very happy and excited to be here this evening. And thank you very, thank you very much for joining. Uh, my name is Lior. And what we are going to do tonight or this evening, we are going to walk around Rome and we're going to see it from a little bit different angle. As you can see here, the title is Masterpieces of Rome on and off the main track. Now, those of you who've already been to Rome, maybe you are going to see here things that you've already seen, that you're going to remember. Maybe you are going to see here things that you haven't seen yet. And as we, yes, as Serene mentioned, Rome is considered to be the eternal city and not by chance. We're talking about a city of something like 2,800 years, okay? And obviously this is a great part of our history. Now, dear friends, first of all, to start put things in their context, let's open the curtain. And the first thing that we are going to see here, this is what is called Piazza Venezia. Italy, it's quite strange what I'm going to say, Italy is younger than the US. US, as we know, was united in 1776. Italy was united, which means became to be a nation only in 1861. Therefore, Italy is younger than the US, even though that when we talk about Italy, we talk about history, we talk about thousand years before and so on. While Italy was united in 1861, the first capital of Italy was Turin in the north. After four years, another capital, a new capital, Florence. After five years, Rome became to be the capital. Rome became to be the capital of Italy only in 1871, which means 10 years after the unification of Italy, and then Rome became to be part of Italy. Till then, it was a city which was actually ruled by the Pope. It was the city-state of the Pope. Now, here we have this monument, wonderful monument, as far as I'm concerned, which is part of Piazza Venezia. And this is what was constructed, was, was built after the unification of Italy, like commemoration for the king of Italy. Italy, at the very beginning, was a kingdom. This building was dedicated to Vittorio Emanuele II, the first king of Italy. And still today, usually the Italians are not, some of them are not crazy about this monument. They sometimes define it as a quite, uh, let's say, not flattering name, such as like typewriter, something like a uh, wedding cake and so on. Again, as I said, I really find it fascinating, beautiful, but at the end, you know, each one with his her own taste. Let's have a look during nighttime at this beautiful building and you are going to see also some other examples, how beautiful they illuminate their city. And to talk about the beginning of Rome itself, let's switch now and let's get to the back of this building. And we get here to this square, which is called Piazza del Compidoglio Square, which was designed by Michelangelo in the middle of the 16th century. Now you can see here the patriotic feelings, right? We can see here how this building is illuminated with the flag of Italy, green, white and red. Another view on this beautiful square, there you are, this is it from the sides. Now, Rome itself, even though that Italy became to be a nation in 1861, Rome was founded, at least following the tradition, in the year 753 BC or BCE, as you wish, on April 21st. Now, what is the story? What happened? Who is the one who is responsible to the foundation? To discover that, we are no, now going to get inside this museum, a wonderful museum in Rome. It's called Capitoline Museums, actually two places. We're getting here from the right, we're getting inside, and we're going to see, first of all, the symbol, which is still today, the symbol of Rome, the Shewolf, the Lupa Capitolina. Now, what's the story? These two beautiful babies, Remus and Romulus, twin brothers were thrown to the Tiber, to the Tiber, to the river in Rome. Somebody was trying to get rid of them by chance or by the help of the gods following the Roman tradition. This she-wolf found them, breastfeeding them, and they grew up and they started to build the city of Rome. In certain points, they fought. Romulus killed his brother, Remus, and kept on building the city of Rome. By the way, those of you are familiar with the story of Cain and Abel, it's quite similar, brother who killed his brother, okay? Now, this is the story of the beginning of Rome. Curiosity about this specific statue, the she-wolf, she's from the fifth 
century, the statue is from the fifth century BC. The twin brothers, the statues are from the 15th century. Why? Because when I discovered this statue, I said, okay, probably this is the she-wolf who suckled the wind. Therefore, let's now add these twin brothers. And now we have the story. The she-wolf, which means I have my theory, don't let the facts ruin it for me. So maybe it was, maybe it was not the original statue, but whatsoever. This is, as I said, one of the most important symbols of the city of Rome. In this specific museum, let's see another amazing statue. This is a Roman replica. Afterwards, we're going to talk about who is the one who commissioned this statue, probably. Here we can see a dying warrior, a dying girl, which means this is barbarian guy. And this is, for me, as a Roman, my enemy. So it's quite strange that me, as a Roman, that I conquered and I defeated. Look at the way I actually decide to show my enemy. I'm not mocking him. I'm not laughing. I'm actually idealizing. Take a look here. We can see the anatomy, the beautiful physiognomy, right? Let's get closer and see it from the back. You can see here the foot. You can see here the wrinkles, how everything is very, very accurate. And you can see here the hair, the same as me. He is barbarian. He is not combing his hair, right? You can see here the mustache. You can see here the necklace. Okay, all of the things that show that this is guy is barbarian. And take a look here at the side at the wound. By the way, those of you who are familiar with paintings and statues that show Jesus on the cross, this is exactly what you see, the cut and the blood which is flowing out, okay? But this is before the period of Jesus. Now, again, taking this statue, we're going now to another museum to see something that has to do with this statue. But since now we're going to get down from the museum, the Capitoline Museums, we're going to get down from Piazza Venezia. You have map in what seven and the other guys sent you. So you can open the map and see now more or less the route. We're going to go from there and we're going towards the other museum, which is called Palazzo Altemps. Since now we're going to do it by foot, if you don't mind, and I hope that you don't mind, we're going to go through the square, which is called Piazza Navona. As far as I'm concerned, one of the most beautiful squares in Rome, and there are lots of beautiful squares in Rome. So let's get here, before we're going to get to the other museum, let's get here in this beautiful square, square which was originally was built in the first century AD, okay? It was built as a place as Hippodrome in which they prepared or they had their racing horses, a horse racing, sorry, and this place was called Circus Agonalis. This is the place, by the way, this is photo that I took on Sunday, okay? And you can just imagine, again, those of you who've already been here, you know how crowded usually this square is, but this is more or less the period of the COVID in which some restrictions, so obviously you can not see this square as crowded as usual, okay? This is another photo, Sunday, which is supposed to be very, very crowded. Now, as we said, the original name of this place was Circus Agonalis. Now, during the years, I'm not going to keep on saying Agonalis, I'm going to say Agona. And after I'm going to say Agona, I'm going to say Nagona. And after I'm going to say Nagona, I'm going to say Navona, and it's going to be Navona. So there you are, this is the name of this square, Piazza Navona. The original name, Agonalis, which means the elliptic place. Now it became to be Piazza Navona, which means it's a twisted name of the original name of the Agonalis. Let's get here to the other side of the square here, getting inside, inside this building with, for having a view over this beautiful, beautiful square. You can see here this, what's supposed to be merry-go-round, okay? And this, this is other, some other photos, really beautiful, beautiful square with these fountains here. There you are, the church which is on the side. And now we're going to get closer to see this monument, which is actually the main fountain in this square, which is also called the Fountain of the Four Rivers, designed by Bernini. Now, for those of you who haven't heard yet about Bernini, the same as Michelangelo is considered to be the great, famous, known artist of the 16th century, Bernini is the great, famous, wonderful artist of the 17th century. Okay, in a way we can say that he's the one who almost rebuilt Rome and sculpted Rome. This is the fountain, and the fountain has four human figures. Each one of them is representing another river in the world. For example, the one here to your left, 
this is a figure which should represent Rio de la Plata, which means we talk here about South America, which means this represents America. On the other side, there is another figure, you can see it here. This figure is the Nile figure in Egypt, which means this figure represents Africa. And strangely enough, it seems that this figure is covering its face. Why? Because when this statue, when this fountain was sculpted, still we did not know what are the sources of the Nile River. That's the reason that the head, the face is covered. We're going to leave the square. We're going to keep on now walking towards the right. And we are going to cross the road carefully. You know how the driving road. So always follow the rules, be careful, behave, okay, and watch it. And we're going to get to this place, which is called Palazzo al Temps, which is right next to the square. We're going to get inside to continue talking about something that we've already, see, that we've already seen, this statue. Here we can see this amazing statue of man who is committing suicide after probably he killed his wife. Now, why did he do that? Because this is, again, another girl, another barbarian, that he knows that the enemy is about to arrive, and he knows that as soon as the enemy is going to get, they are going to kill him anyway, and probably going to rape his wife and take her as a slave. So he killed her, and he, commit, he is committing suicide. And take a look here at this amazing, obviously not the story, but at the amazing statue. You can really feel the fabric, right? The way it flies away. You can actually, it seems like he's in a moment of escaping of movement. You can see here, again, on your right, she's dead or she's dying. And he is completely concentrating upon stabbing the sword in his chest because he is now going to save his soul instead of his body. And you can see here again, also how the blood is actually spurts outside of the wound. Now, probably the one who commissioned this statue, that's what we think today. And again, this is the copy. The one who commissioned the copy is Julius Caesar, the one who was murdered in the middle of March in the year 44 BC. Now, why you, Julius Caesar, commissions this kind of statue about a story which happened 200 years before you? Why? Because I am now talking about the Gauls, the people from France of our day, and I'm fighting the Gauls. And you see who is my enemy. These are not cowards. These are brave people and have a very important and strong enemy, which means if I'm fighting this enemy, you understand who I am. So this is actually, I'm upgrade, upgrading myself. Julius the Caesar, as we said, if he's really the one who commissioned, maybe also these statues were positioned, obviously not inside the museum, outside, outside the temple. And this is a temple which can be stand found today in Rome. So just imagine if you want to see things in their context, the statues here are on the steps, just to pretend. So obviously you get completely different sensation. The one who was among those who participated in the conspiracy of killing Julius Caesar is Brutus, who was actually Julius' friend. And Julius saying, are you too Brutus? If the, the tradition is correct, this guy is maybe Brutus. And take a look here that this statue, which is maybe from the first century BC, look how accurate it is. Just take a look at the details here. We can actually see the stubble, how it's accurate. This is really look like a real person, which is right in front of you. Okay. Now we're going to leave the Capitoline Museums and we're going to get, now this statue is there, and we're going to get to a place which is very near Piazza della Repubblica. Those of you who got to Rome by train, got to the Termini station, in two steps you're getting to Piazza della Repubblica, okay? So this is the square itself. I could not avoid myself from taking picture, look at the clouds here, which is just part of the beauty of the art of this city, okay? In the center of this square, we can see here this fountain from the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. And right next to this square, there is this beautiful museum, which is called Museo delle Terme, in which we're going to see now another statue, which is very, very accurate, maybe from the same period. Take a look here at the boxer. Now, guys, just to mention, boxer of those times, it's not those who were fighting and were trying to punch you on your body. They were punching one another on their face. 
take a look here, this statue is exactly in human size, which means when you see the statue, the only thing that when I see it, I try not to bother him. I don't want to interrupt. This is really a real sensation of somebody is here with you in the same room. Let's get closer. You can see here the smashed nose because he kept on being punched on his face. What you see, these are not faults. These are actually scars on his face. And today when you see the whole right, the holes actually instead of eyes, just imagine that once upon a time this statue had eyes. Don't be perplexed, don't get scared, but please take a look, let's try to imagine that maybe the statue originally looked that way. It really seems like a real figure who is looking at you. Now we're going to leave this beautiful museum and we're going to get to Via Cavu, you can see it on your map. Via Cavu, Piazza Repubblica, San Paolo Streets is going to be Via Cavu, and we're going to get down towards the Colosseum. But before we're going to get to the Colosseum, we're going to stop and we're going to get into a beautiful church, which is called St. Peter, not the famous one, St. Peter in Chains, San Pietro in Vincoli. There, the most famous monument is what you're going to see now, Julius II's tomb. Julius II, he was a pope. He's the one who made and forced Michelangelo to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Michelangelo did not want to paint, he had to paint, okay? That is the Pope's tomb. Tomb that should have been created of 40 statues above human size. The only statue finally, which is by Michelangelo, is what we see here in the center, which is Moses. Now, let's get closer and take a look at the Moses. And we're going to raise our now up two questions. First of all, getting closer and look at this really great, strong figure. You can see the bird, okay? Take a look. And when we're getting closer, take a look at Moses' forehead. Why Moses has horns? Where is that written? Let's get to the sources. Let's get and read the Old Testament or the Bible, depends what your religion is. But whatever it is, let's see what it's written there. Maybe there is some justification. Let's read. When Moses go down from the mountain of Sinai with the Ten Commandments, the, his father, his brother, Aaron, and the other Israelites saw him, and his face was radiant. Now, dear friends, radiant or ray in Hebrew, it's the same word as horn. So when the Bible was translated into Latin, it was says that his face was horned. This is one explanation that I do not accept because the one who translated the Bible knew what he was talking about, about Saint Jerome, okay? So here maybe the idea of horns, it's not horns because both the translator and Michelangelo thought that Moses had horns. No, they knew that horns also have the meaning of power, of strength, of like a halo. And this is probably the real reason, the real explanation. That was one question to ask, and this is the answer. Another question, why Moses on the first place? Why not Jesus? Why not Mary? I'm a Pope on my tomb, show me Jesus. Show me, you know what? Show me Saint Peter, who is considered to be following the Catholicism, the first Pope. Why Moses? What? So let's answer also about that. Following Christianity, there are three eras, there are three periods. The first one is what is called ante legem which means before the law. And guys, you do know this word. Everybody heard about antipasti, right? The thing that usually you're supposed to eat before you have your dinner or your meal, because antipasti, it's before the meal. So antelegen, it's before the law, okay? Before we got the Ten Commandments. With Moses, we received the Ten Commandments, and now we get to the period which is called sublegen, which means under the law. And this is the reason that Moses is so important. Now, if I'm Jew, I'm still there in this period, which is under the law. If I'm Christian, I'm already in a new period, which is called sub gratia, which means under the grace, the period which starts with the arrival of Jesus. That's the reason me, as a Christian, I can go to the priest and confess, as Catholic I mean, I can confess and my sins were erased. If I'm Jewish, there's another way, but not the idea of the confession, okay? So this is it. 
We're going outside of this church just to keep on walking towards the Colosseum. We're going to get down from Via Cavu afterwards. The name of the street is being changed. And we're coming out from here. And we get here to this huge street, which is called Foro Imperiale. And looking to the left already from far away, you can see the Colosseum. And let's get closer. This is it. The one who is responsible to this building, this is Vespasian Caesar of the first century AD. And yes, the Colosseum, all of the compliments in the, war, in the world. Wonderful building, fascinating, amazing, very complicated construction, genius construction. But guys, please do not ever, never forget the context of this building. Why, on the first place, this building was built, especially now being mature than the first time when I saw it as a kid, I realized that actually, at least in the beginning, I'm looking at a killing machine. Yes, today, again, wonderful, thank goodness, does not have any more this meaning, but this building was built to entertain other people by looking at the suffering of the slaves of the Christians who were brought here to be tortured, to be executed, to entertain the others with the blood. Obviously also the beasts which were sent here. Now again, you can just see how beautiful this building is being illuminated. This is again, when I saw this, I said, no, I have to take the photo, okay? And this is it. Take a look inside the Colosseum. You can just imagine here that once upon a time was a floor which collapsed. Here we can see just the tunnels in which the slaves and the beasts were before they were sent to the arena. And just imagine that in this building, it could populate something like 50,000 to 80,000 at once. And just imagine that in those times, Rome was a city of something like 1 million people. Okay, so 10% of the people could be here at the same time of the city, just imagine. We're going to get outside of the Colosseum. This is the Colosseum here on our left. We're going to start climbing here in this very, let's say, low uh, climbing. And we get to this monument, which is a very, very famous one. This is the Titus Arch. Titus, Vespasian's son, he got to Jerusalem to show the Jews what he think about them and what he can do, and he ruined the temple, and this is actually the beginning of the Jewish diaspora of 2,000 years. Now, let's get closer to this arch. Now, this is during nighttime, getting even closer, okay, with which we are going to have a nice excuse, excuse to start talking about the Jewish history, in Rome at least. Now, there you are. This is the Titus arch. This is the dedication to Titus. And when we get to see the arch from within to the left, here, you can see this relief. Sometimes people are mistaken and saying, look at the poor Jews, poor guys, how they actually took the, the spoils from Jerusalem, from the temple. And the... now, guys, these are not the Jews. Yes, this is the menorah. This is the symbol of the Jews. Still today, by the way, the Star of David, this is not the only symbol of the Jews. This is the symbol of the Jews. OK, so the menorah is actually telling you, I am the Roman. My gods conquered the Jewish God, and this is the reason, that was the reason it was so important for them to ruin the temple, not just conquering Jerusalem, okay? The guys who are here are not the Jews, these are actually the Roman soldiers. I'm not going to let the Jewish slave to have this crown of floral leaves on his head. So therefore, these are the Roman soldiers who are carrying the spoils back or to Rome to show you the victory. We're going to leave now the arch. Again, this is the menorah. We're going to leave now the arch. This is the arch. And now we're getting into this place, which is actually called Forum Romanum. This is the very heart of ancient Rome, the very beginning of Rome. That was the sacred place in Rome. Today, you can visit it. You have to buy tickets. It's going to be better always to book in advance. We're going to get here now in the Forum Romanum. We're going to leave backwards the Titus Arch. There you are. Obviously, what you see here, this is just the reconstruction of the temples that once populated all this. Take a look here, just at the clouds, it's enough to look at to fall in love with the city. I mean, the combination of the nature and the urban, I mean, really beautiful, beautiful city, really. Thank goodness it exists, okay? This is now during, in a second, you're going to see 
during nighttime. Again, the beautiful way they illuminate it. This is another arch. And when you're going to keep on walking here, climbing up, you're actually getting back again to Piazza del Campidoglio, where we visited at the very beginning. On the other side, we have Piazza Venezia. And now we are going to get inside the museum again to see another thing, to see another thing which has to do with Judaism. Take a look here. These were once capitals on the top of columns. Those of you who can read Hebrew, and Hebrew, this is my mother's tongue, I can tell you that this is very, very challenging. The columns from probably the first, second century AD, the inscription actually is from the 16th century when Hebrew was just a sacred language, not language actually that you use in your everyday life, like more or less the Latin of our days, if you wish. You can see here inscription, which is quite fascinating and exciting from the 16th century. Those of you who want to practice again your Hebrew, go for it. Instead, let's make it easier. Let's read immediately what it's written here in English. This is actually dedication to the person who died, okay, in the 16th century in something like 1560. And the reason I brought this, because in 1560 in Rome was already, unfortunately, a ghetto. And guys, in 1555, five years earlier, Pope Paul IV, he published a bull, a document, which is called Cum Nimis Absurdum. And this document is actually starting in that way. This is what he's saying. Since it is absurd and utterly inconvenient that the Jews, who through their own fault were condemned by God to eternal slavery, that they actually, they now live among us, they, so we have to put them in a separate way away from us. And that's the reason the ghetto was built. By the way, the first ghetto in the world was built a couple of years before that in Venice. Let's proceed. This is the Teatro Marcellus. Here, this is more or less the beginning of the Jewish ghetto. This is a monument from the first century BC. Okay, the Jewish ghetto starts here. Still exists today. Again, not in the meaning of the ghetto. You can live there, you can live out there. Okay, but again, part of the history. Now, 1861, as we said, Italy was united. Fine. 1871, Rome became to be part of Italy and the emancipation, the equal right that the Jews got in 1861 in Italy, now also in Rome, which means me, Jew in Rome, what I'm going to do? I'm going to build myself my own temple. I'm not going to go to the church. I'm not going to get to the mosque. I am going to get to my temple, which means to my synagogue, okay? So therefore you can see here from one of the bridges of Rome, take a look here far away, you can see this is the synagogue of Rome. This is the synagogue of Florence. The reason I brought both of them because both of them are quite similar. They look like a mosque. They look like a church because I want to be integrated in the society. It's not that I am this Jew. No, I'm like the other Jews. I'm like the other Muslims. I'm like the other Christians. I'm like everybody else, okay? There you are. Let's take a closer look at the synagogue. Again, this is part of the ghetto. This is the Teatro Machado that we've mentioned before. Okay, a closer look at the synagogue, which looks like, again, something which is still quite particular. Now, it seems like that from here onwards, happily ever after, right? the Jews got equal rights. Unfortunately, at the end of 1938, Mussolini published the Russia Laws. The Jews are not allowed to teach. They're not allowed to take part in factories of the state. They're not allowed to go to school, etc., etc. And we do know that also, in a certain point, the Germans, the Germans, the, the, I'm talking about the Nazis, got to Rome and Jews were sent to be. I mean, now, just take a look here, and this is photo from 1941 in protest in Rome. And let's see one of the signs, what it's written here. Take a look here what is written first in Italian, then we're going to translate it. Again, this is obviously protest against the Jews. Take a look. In Italian, it's written here on this sign, il Gideo difende in tutti i modi loro rubato, which means the Jew defends the stolen God in any possible way. Okay, and this is obviously part of the anti-Semitism. Guys, so far about the Jewish history for now, now we're just going to get to another monument, which is very near to the Jewish ghetto, which is the 
Pantheon, beautiful building from the second century AD, probably was designed by the Caesar Adrian. And just take a look here, this amazing, really one of the seven wonders of the modern world. Take a look here and let's get closer. Just imagine that this amazing temple, which was converted to church in the seventh century during the Middle Ages served as a marketplace for chickens because this place is covered. This place is well separate. Why shouldn't I? Let's use it. I'm not going to waste it, right? So just imagine today, obviously, it's also a museum. Let's see it also during nighttime and get inside. By the way, at least still a couple of months ago, it was still a free entrance. Hopefully, they're going to continue with that. Take a look. This is when you're inside looking upwards at the ceiling. You can see what is called the oculus, the eye, which is something like almost 30 feet the diameter. It's completely open, which means when it's raining, the rain is getting inside. Let's take a look downwards. And here, again, it became to be a church. Here you can see this monument. Let's get closer. And this monument is actually the tomb of Raphael. Now, Raphael, especially, I think, kids, maybe who were sometimes, you know, in one of the visits, I went with a beautiful family and I said, okay, now today we are going to see works of art by Raphael, Michelangelo. And then I said to the kids, you know who they are? I said, yes, the Ninja Temples. So, yes, this is a great service. But, guys, Raphael, obviously, we are talking about not the Ninja Temple. We are talking about the great, great painter and also architect from the 16th century that unfortunately died when he was only 37 years old, very young. Take a look here, the inscription on his tomb. This is in Latin. Let's translate it. In English, it says, and this is very strong, here lies, lies down Raphael, by whom nature feared to be outdone while he had lived. And when he died, feared that she herself would die. Okay, it's a very strong thing. Now, since we're talking about Raphael, let's now go to the southern part of the city. We're going to cross the river, we're going to cross the Tiber, and we're going to the place which is called Trastevere. Tras, like transfer, moving, right? Trust ever the other side of the Tiber. And here we are getting into a beautiful, really, villa from the beginning of the 16th century, Villa Farnesina. This is the way it's called today. Take a look at the map. You can see it. It's right on the river, but again, on the left side, on the lower part, Villa Farnesina. There is an American university next to it. Okay. And obviously, if I'm a banker, I'm going to commission this villa just to show you what I can do. But it's not only that. It's not just I built this building. I'm going to commission, I'm going to invite the most important, famous, known, requested artist in Rome, more or less in this time, which is Raphael, who is Raphael. And Raphael is going to get into this villa and he's going to paint me frescoes, wall paintings. Among them, you can see here, this beautiful painting which shows you the nymph Galatea. It's a story from the ancient Greek and Roman mythology. Now, take a look here at this woman and Raphael for him and for the concepts of the 16th century. And I'm not judging here, I just want to pay attention to. This is the perfection of a woman, okay? I am saying it because sometimes in one period, we expect women to be very thin. In other period, we expect women to be... So what I'm saying here that is not right or wrong, good or bad. This is concept, this is fashion that can be changed from one period to the other and even more for one way of looking at the things at the other. I can think that way, he can think that way, the other thing in other, and which is fine. Now, in this same place, now let's climb to the second floor. By the way, if you need a rest, there's a place here for the restroom, to the toilet, okay? In the same direction, instead of going right, we're going to the left, we're going to get to the second floor in which you, which is called Sala delle Prospettive, the room of the perspectives. What you see here, these are frescoes, these are wall paintings. And when you look here to the right, you actually have the chance to have a beautiful view of the city of, Fro of, the city of Rome, but over the city of Rome, not of the 21st century, of the city of Rome of the 16th century. Because what you're seeing here, this is not a real background. This is not a real view. This is painting. 
and even more what you see here the columns these are painted columns this is what is called complay fooling the eye which is amazing and dear friends this is the beginning of the 16th century just imagine in the same area of the Trastevere, we get nearby to a beautiful church, very simple one considered to be Franciscan church, in which now we're going to get inside, San Francesco Arripa, this is the name of the church. We're getting inside, this is the entrance, we got inside, you can see here, nobody here. This is unfortunately in one of the days of the restrictions during the COVID period, you can see only one person and also on the bench themselves, you can see the place in which you can see it, and the place that you have to live free because of the social distance. You keep on walking here, turning left, take a look here. Now, when we turn left, turn your head to the left. This is what you see. Let's get closer. Let's get inside this chapel as much as we can. We cannot get actually inside just to see it. And you can see this amazing, beautiful statue, which represents woman, sacred or blessed woman, Beata Ludovica. Now, look. Again, reading the things in their context. Today, when we see this kind of gesture of somebody who is holding the breast, it might be understood as something which is maybe sexual, but there's nothing sexual here. This woman, she is dying in this very moment, and she is being united with her groom, who is the groom in this case, Jesus, and she is now giving her heart or her body or her soul to be united with Jesus. This woman, when she became to be a widow, she was quite rich woman. She decided she is going to bake bread for the poor, in which she is going to insert golden coins. And when she is giving the bread, she said, "God is going to take care of those who need it. He, God knows who needs and who know." So. God is going to decide. That's the reason she is holding her breast because this is the meaning of charity. Now take a look what you're seeing here. This is not fabric. This is not cloth. This is a marble. And this work is by Bernini. Also here, the lace on the pillow. Dear friends, this is marble. And you have the feeling, you have a sensation of softness. To see another great masterpiece by Bernini, we're going to leave now Trastevere and we're going to get back towards the place which is very near to Piazza della Repubblica. There you are. Piazza della Repubblica with this great fountain in the center, the fountain of the night. And here we can get into another church which is called Santa Maria della Vittoria, St. Mary of the Victory. And this very, very interesting statue by Bernini shows you a saint, Christian saint, Santa Teresa d'Avila, that she had visions. In one of the visions that actually we have it still written by her, she is describing that a beautiful young angel came to her, what you can see here, holding, holding in his hand an arrow. At the edge of the arrow, this angel, I mean here, was a flame, and he kept on penetrating into her entrails with this arrow over and over again. And she continuing and saying that the pain was so great that I did not want him to quit. Now here, when you look at this statue, it can be understood that something is completely, let's say, mystical, something of ecstasy, or maybe somebody else can take it, something, something completely different. And we do know that people criticized this statue, one of the people in the 18th century was looking at this statue and said, if this is divine love, I know everything about it. About it. Don't tell me what it is. Okay? But you can just see again how people can see different things at the same thing, which is interesting. There you are. Just amazing statue. Go there when you have the chance. A, ch a church, not to miss. Take a look very carefully at the opening hours. Okay? It's not open from the evening. There has some limited hours. So try not to miss it. We're leaving here this church just to get and see another thing by Bernini. We're getting here to the Galleria Borghese. This is actually on the top north part of your map. You're going to see Galleria Borghese with the beautiful gardens. This is it. This is the villa from outside. Again, when you go there and you want to go to the gallery, please book in advance. It's almost impossible to find tickets on the spot. So always book it in advance and you book it to the specific date 
and hour, and you have intervals of two hours, which means if you book to nine o'clock, you can be there till 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock, you're going, afterwards you have to go out. You cannot stay there, okay? Now, this is one look at the villa. Let's see it from the front. Now, after we got our tickets, we're going to climb here the steps, getting here to the entrance, showing the tickets, they're going to be stripped off, and we're going to get inside, and here inside, we can see here another beautiful statue by Bernini, which shows you the cardinal, the one who commissioned, the one who actually built this villa, Scipione Borghese. Take a look here, really, how Bernini was genius. Take a look here. You can actually feel the softness of the body of this cardinal. You can almost smell his breath from the mouth. And Bernini said, I sculpt my figures a moment before or after they spoke, which means you can still feel the body. Another thing, take a look here at his coat, take a look at the buttons. Now this cardinal, he ate quite good. Therefore, when you want to button the buttons, it's quite difficult. So Bernini is actually showing you that yes, one button you managed, another one you cannot close it completely because there's something underneath which is pushing out. Okay, so it's become to be so realistic. And this is the greatness also by Bernini. Now, dear friends, we are going to get down from Galleria Borghese, you can see it on your map, into the street, which is called Via Veneto, Vittorio Veneto, get down there. You're going to get down now, you can do it. Up. Take a look at the map. From there, you get in certain point into the street, which is called Via Sistina. And then you are getting to this place here, which is a beautiful church, which is called uh, Santa Trinita dei Monti. Actually, you came from here, okay, or from there, depend what's the route that you took. When you're giving now your back to the church and looking forward, and you're going to wait here during, I mean, try to be here during sunset, this is probably in the day of clear sky, this is the images that you are going to see. Enjoy, guys, enjoy. This is beautiful. Okay, now take a look here. Just you can see how the sun is pumping out right with from these uh, beautiful domes. And here we have two options what we are going to do, or that we're going to go directly to the what seems like small dome, but it's a huge dome, which is actually Saint Peter, which is in the Vatican, the Saint Peter, or instead we're going to get down from the Spanish steps, and we're going to get to via the Condotti, and afterwards we're going to understand why. So instead of, you know, trying to take a decision, we're just going to do them both. We're going to take taxi or metro, and we're going to get now directly to St. Peter's Church. Afterwards, we're going to get back here, and we're going to get down the Spanish steps. So let's go and get to St. Peter's, beautiful, amazing church, considered to be the biggest church in Europe. This is the church from outside. This is now during daytime. The dome was designed by Michelangelo. We talk about the end of the 16th century. Here, you're going to see queue that unfortunately in, th in this period there is no. Okay, this is the queue after the security checking. We're going to get here. We're going to get into the church. There you are. You can keep on walking straight forward. Or before you're going to get here to this canopy, you're going to turn right, and this is what you're going to see. This wall made out of glass. Behind it, you see this amazing statue, which is by Michelangelo, the statue which is called Pietà. In English, it's pity and piety. Now, first of all, those of you who know or read the New Testament, there's not a single moment in which it says that when Jesus died and he was taken down from the cross, before he was buried, he was put on Mary's knees. Does not exist. This is part of the tradition which was created in France and Germany in the 13th and 14th centuries. Michelangelo got this commission from a cardinal, French cardinal, that was his tomb, this cardinal, and therefore he represented this story. Now, let's get closer to this statue, which is really an unbelievable statue. You can see here the dead body of Christ. Now, this poor guy was on the, on the cross. People spit on him. People humiliated him. He was tortured. Yet, take a look here. What a wonderful, perfect body. Why? Because this is statue of the Renaissance that every, everything has to be just perfect. Now, somebody said in the 16th century that we can feel 
the dead body of Christ in the living marble. The marble is look like it is alive. Take a look here at the folds of the statue. Take a look at the hand of Jesus. You can really feel that you are in front of a real person. And this is Michelangelo who sculpted the statue when he was only 23, 24 years old. Just imagine. When he finished work on the statue, still not known, unknown artist, he stood next to the statue, listening what people have to say about the statue. And there was a bunch of people from Milan discussing among themselves. And somebody asked, asked who did the statue? That one said, who did the statue? Obviously, or oh, artist from Milan. Michelangelo heard and said, I was working on this statue for two years, and now they're going to give credit. No way. He got back to the statue during nighttime, took chisel and hammer on Mary's band on her shirt. He chiseled this inscription. Now it's written in Latin, but in a second, we're going to translate it. He wrote here, Michelangelo Bonarotis facebet, which means Michelangelo from Florence made it, not from Milan, not from Rome, not from Naples, I am from Florence. And we do talk about city states in those times that I'm very proud about my city state, which is not part of the United Italy. We're going now to see, unfortunately, sad story about this statue, Modern Madness, 1973. A guy got into this church looking at this wonderful statue and he said, this is Jesus who got but No way, I am Jesus who was resurrected from the dead and he just started to smash the statue with hammer. What you see here, it can hardly be seen, but here there's a very, very thin line that actually shows you that this part was damaged because he managed to ruin the edge of the nose, part of the veil, broke Jesus' hand and some other damages. Thank goodness for the restorations, we can still see again this beauty of the statue. Now we're leaving St. Peter, we're getting back to Santa Trinita dei Monti, and again, this is the church, this is the view, we've just been here. Now we're going to get downwards the steps, the Spanish steps, and into the Via dei Condotti. We're just about to end, unfortunately, our visit for today. We are going to get down from the Spanish steps. By the way, I think that this information is relevant for those who want to climb it, less for those who want to get down. Uh, it's 135 steps. So calculate your <laughs> steps before you're going to do it, at least if you know you're going to get down. So this is fine. Now, the Spanish steps are from the 18th century. By the way, today it's not allowed anymore. Maybe those of you who've already been to Rome were there when it was still allowed to sit on the steps, eat something. Today, it's not allowed. They're actually going to send you where This is now only the place in which you can walk down and walk up, but you're not, you cannot, you're not allowed to sit there. When we're still on the step, pen steps, now going to look forward. This is the view that you're going to have. Here you have the fountain by Bernini's father, the barcaccia, the boat, because when Rome was flooded, it says they probably boat got up to here, which is quite long distance. And the street that you see here, this is what is called Via dei Condotti. And Via dei Condotti, that now we're walking in it, there you are, you can see here again, the Santa Trinita dei Monti, where we get down from. Via dei Condotti, this street is mainly known, maybe you heard of, I don't know, probably you did, about the big names. Burberry, Louis Vuitton, Bulgari, Dior, Gucci, Giorgio Armani, and so on. If not always on this specific street, it's also nearby. Now, if you're going to keep on walking straight forward, in certain points, you're going to get to Via del Corso, another very big, beautiful street in Rome, lots of shopping also there. And in Via del Corso, you're going to turn left, going forward in certain point again to the left, and then you can get to the place that at least following the tradition, if you're going to do something, you have guaranteed return to Rome. And therefore, that means that now we're talking about Fontana di Trevi, okay? This beautiful, amazing fountain from the middle of the 18th century. Now, I believe that it's quite clear that when, for you, that when I took the picture of this place, obviously I had to raise up the camera as high as possible. Otherwise, I would have taken photo only of heads because this place usually is very, very crowded, okay? So there you can see it here. This is actually facade of a building. This is during daytime, this is during nighttime. Again, this is 
supposed to be or ocean or Poseidon, Neptune, the god of sea. And again, this is during nighttime. And if you wish to follow the tradition, when you're there, fine. You saw this fountain, you fell in love again with the, per with the person next to you, with the fountain itself, okay? And what you're supposed to do now, you have to turn your back to the fountain. If you use your right hand, please do it that way. Otherwise, obviously, the other hand. Take a coin and throw the coin without hurting anybody, without hurting anybody. Throw the coin, the coin above your left shoulder and make a wish, okay? If it works, please tell me because I want to do it as well. Anyway, this is the tradition is telling you like that you're going to get back to Rome. Now, dear friends, I know what is the situation now in these days. Hopefully we're going to pass it in quicker than we think. But when it's going to end and when you're going to get to Rome by train, by car, by ship, by airplane, by flying, whatever you wish, just looking forward to seeing you and already now, now I would like to thank you very much. Thank you very much again, Selwyn. I'm telling you Arrivederci, which means see you and be safe, take care and good health. Happy New Year and thank you very, very much again for taking part. Thank you. Thanks again. Dad, you got to unmute. Dad, you got to unmute. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, okay, good. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, didn't realize I was on mute. Um, Lior, you did a fabulous job. I got many texts and emails while you were presenting, thanking us for putting this on and for complimenting you for doing such a good job. I mean, you're high energy. You love you what you do. You love your city. You love art. And it all came through. And there's no better way to go on a journey like this than to be accompanied by someone who's really into the field. Uh, for you, it's not an academic study. It's it's who you are. And that's okay. quite obvious. So uh, for those of you who are planning uh, to visit Rome or Florence or any of the big cities in Italy, would like to have an amazing tour guide uh, and a best plug for Lior. Uh, you won't go wrong with him. In the meantime, Lior, we'll take what we can get from you. This virtual tour was amazing. And uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, in Rome and Florence and Venice. Uh, on our next trip to Italy. Thank you so much, everybody. I want to end by thanking you all for joining us, wishing you all safe, distanced uh, life, waiting for this dark tunnel to end and for us all to emerge into the sunshine. Thank you very much, everybody. God bless. Arrivederci. Arrivederci. Thank you very much.